You know, the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followed him, and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory. And in his name the Gentiles hope. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Well, in the United States, in our culture, we love stories of overnight success. We live in what we like to think of as a land of opportunity, and so it's exciting to hear of someone who seizes a particular opportunity and maybe catches lightning in a bottle so that they experience some kind of overnight success. That's fun. Maybe we would be the kinds of people who would get to enjoy that sort of success as well. But if you ever dig into these stories of supposed overnight success, what you come to find invariably is that it really wasn't overnight at all. As, as Steve Jobs wrote, overnight success takes a very long time. It's never just overnight. Usually when you find someone who supposedly was uh, someone who had overnight success, uh, you find a tremendous amount of work that had led up to that point. Uh, for example, um, author Stephen King, not uh, one of my favorite authors, but a tremendously popular author, has sold 350 million copies of his books. Uh, you might think that might be someone who was an overnight instant success, but he tells the story in his book on writing uh, that when he was young, he wrote a number of stories and sent them off into magazines to try to get them published. And he would inevitably, at the very beginning, receive rejection slip after rejection slip after re rejection slip. He saved all these rejection slips as motivation, I guess, and hung them on a nail that he had driven into the, the wall in his bedroom until there were so many rejection slips that the nail could not hold the weight and they all fell to the floor one day. Well, he picked up those rejection slips, he put them on a spike where they could lie flat, and he kept writing until he got that break and seemed to be an overnight success, but that, of course, doesn't understand all of the many rejection slips that had come before that. Now, when we think of Easter, we're celebrating success. We are celebrating the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ, not to publish a number of books, but the victory of Jesus Christ over the greatest threat that we face, the threats and the evils of sin and death and the devil. And we know that when Jesus did was very much an overnight success. He was dead in the grave one night on Saturday night, and overnight in the morning, on Sunday morning, he rose from the dead. But whenever we come to Easter, and we try to remind ourselves this each time that we come to Easter, that when we come to Easter and think and give special attention to the resurrection of Jesus, this isn't something, this victory of Jesus over the grave is not something that we can abstract or, or separate from everything else that Jesus did over the course of his life. It wasn't that God could simply send his son into the world just to be resurrected from the dead. Everything had to lead up from that. Jesus had to fulfill all righteousness leading up to this, and that's why it took such a long time. And even if you think about the time before Jesus' life, you have to think about the hundreds and thousands of years in the history of God's people leading up to that time. And when you start thinking about all of this time, it wasn't that Jesus was learning a craft. What took so long over that course of time? It wasn't that God was using trial and error. He tried some things a long time ago. Those didn't work. Well, God made a mistake, so he's going to try something different. Of course, that's not what it was. God, rather, was working out a plan, a perfect plan of redemption. This wasn't someone like Thomas Edison working through 6,000 versions of the filament in order to find the right filament that would last a long time for him to invent the long-lasting light bulb. It wasn't trial and error trying to find the right thing. Edison wished he could have found the right filament on the thousandth try, or especially on the first try, but he had a lack of wisdom and knowledge, wisdom and knowledge that God does not lack. So what took so long? 
for Jesus to rise from the dead. Today, as we think of our Lord resurrected, and it's been 2,000 years, and still we are crying out, how long, O Lord, until Jesus returns? What is taking so long? Well, the passage we have this morning is a passage that orients us to the fullness of the plan of our Lord Jesus Christ to accomplish the entirety of God's redemptive work in the world. Our Lord Jesus does not do this work haphazardly. He is not rushed, but rather patiently, meticulously, methodically. Jesus is doing everything necessary to fulfill all righteousness. So this morning, as we're giving special attention to the resurrection of Jesus, this is the passage that orients us to why did it take so long to get to that victory? As we continue to wait the final victory when Jesus will bring all of his enemies under his feet and bring his people into everlasting rest when he returns. Our big idea then this morning is this, that Jesus is still bringing his justice to victory. Jesus is still bringing his justice to victory. So as you look at this passage this morning, three parts. Number one, a purposeful ministry, a purposeful ministry. Number two, paradoxical approach, a paradoxical approach. And then number three, promised victory, promised victory. Well, in verses 15 and 16, we see that Jesus' ministry was a purposeful ministry. The first part, a purposeful ministry. We read in verse 15 that Jesus, aware of this. What's Jesus aware of? We have to remember what we looked at last week when we looked at the previous passage, uh, that in verse 14, we read that after Jesus restored and healed the withered hand of a man on the Sabbath, that it wasn't a, uh, the, the hand which symbolized the withered view of the Pharisees regarding the Sabbath, Jesus stretched it out, healed it so that it was healthy and full, like how he had come to restore the Sabbath. We read after Jesus does that in verse 14, the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Now, Previously, so far in the Gospel of Matthew, we have seen the Pharisees criticize Jesus. We've seen them question Jesus. Uh, particularly back in verse 2 of this same chapter, the Pharisees criticized and questioned Jesus about why he was allowing his disciples to pluck heads of grain while they were going through a grain field on the Sabbath. But this is something new. This is a new level. Again, formerly they had certainly raised questions about Jesus. And while conflict had perhaps we can see had been brewing, after Jesus has this teaching and performs this miracle of healing on the Sabbath, suddenly the Pharisees take this up to an entirely different level where they are actively plotting our Lord's murder. Jesus, being aware of this, we read that he withdrew from there. Now, why does Jesus withdraw? Well, it's very important to be clear about this. We might read about this withdrawal that Jesus makes and think, well, maybe Jesus is running. Maybe Jesus is afraid of dying. Maybe he's shrinking from the mission. But in fact, that's not at all what we see. Jesus is not shrinking from his mission. He knows, rather, that his mission means that there is a timeline to follow, that there is more righteousness to fulfill of the redemptive plan that God has given him. And therefore, the time has not yet come for him to be crucified. That day will come, but it's not here yet. And so Jesus withdraws from there, and as he withdraws, it's not that he is avoiding suffering, it is rather that this is a part of Jesus' suffering. Exile, being forced to flee from your home, from a place of safety, this is suffering. And Jesus is fulfilling all aspects of his suffering. He came not just to suffer in one big gulp from the cup of God's wrath at the end of his life at the cross, although he did do that. But rather, Jesus is characterized as the man of sorrows. His entire life is characterized by sorrow and suffering as Jesus enters into the entirety of what we deserve because of our sin. The part of that suffering here means that Jesus must flee. But as he does this, notice that Jesus doesn't take his eye off the ball. He doesn't say, well, I guess I got a little bit more time to hang out. Time I got to kill, maybe I'll take up golfing or something uh, to avoid what I'm supposed to be doing. No, Jesus, and by the way, golfing is fine, but um, Jesus continues and he goes right back to his mission. 
We read, many followed him, and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. Jesus is still going about his work. He is still healing people, which is a part of the ministry and mission that Jesus has been about so far. And he's not wanting the adulation of the crowd. He's not wanting to be celebrated and praised for all of the good works he's doing. He's ordering people not to make him known. Now, part of this certainly fits in with the danger he's facing. He doesn't want to draw attention because, again, his time has not yet come for when he will become at the center of the spotlight and he will be killed. But until that time, Jesus demonstrates here a purposeful faithfulness in a purposeful ministry where he is not lackadaisical. He is doing everything necessary to fulfill all righteousness that his Father has given him to fulfill. Now, it's important to see that Jesus is still at work, that he is still suffering, and he is still faithfully executing his mission, because this is the background. This is the picture that that Matthew wants us to have in our minds, because this is why he begins to quote from the prophet Isaiah in the rest of this passage coming up. So keep this image of Jesus in your minds. What we need to see here for the most part, or or for right now, though, is that Jesus is not wasting or killing time. He is patiently, meticulously, methodically fulfilling his mission. And and, and this is important for us to see. Recognize that some kinds of work are so important, they simply cannot be rushed. You simply cannot rush through these things because they are too important to get right. Let me give you an illustration of this. Uh, One of the most sought-after delicacies in the world, food, food that you pay a lot of money to get, is found in Japan. It's a particular fish called the fugu fish or the kora fugu fish or, uh, in English, the tiger puffer fish. Now, if you go to Tokyo to have a meal of this fugu fish, uh, you can expect to pay about $200 for a single meal of this delicacy. That's part of, the re- part of the reason I have never actually eaten this food. Another part of the reason that this is such a delicacy, this is so sought after, is that this fish carries a poison that is 200 times as deadly as cyanide. To sell this fish as a delicacy, to sell this fish as a restaurant, a chef has to be specially licensed to prepare this fish. This requires multiple years of training. This isn't a a weekend course. This isn't an overnight success. You don't want someone who has been an overnight success preparing your fugu fish for you to eat. It requires using specialized Japanese knives to very carefully, very patiently, meticulously, deliberately, methodically separating what is edible, what is a delicacy, from what will literally kill you. In fact, in Japan, there have been a number of deaths reported from people who have eaten this fish, not from the trained, licensed chefs, but from people who try to do it alone. There are some YouTube videos about how to prepare your own fugu fish, but let me be very clear, I would not recommend going that route. Sometimes very long, very hard work is a part of a learning curve. Again, when Edison had to figure out which of the filaments would make that long-lasting light bulbs, it took 6,000 attempts. Part of the learning curve, a lack of knowledge supplemented through experimentation until through trial and error you gain that knowledge. Other times, even for these chefs, who have undergone all of this training, who are at the top of their game in terms of separating the poison from the actual food, uh, we are talking about work that simply cannot be rushed. Even if you are an expert, you cannot rush through the work. This is not an example of where my children might complain if two of their foods touch on their plate and it's an inconvenience to them. We are talking if the wrong part of the food touches the wrong part of the food, it will literally kill you. God's redemptive plans are not long in the making because he is working on this on the fly, because he doesn't know something and has to learn something through trial and error. Rather, this work happens over centuries, over millennia, over 33 years of Jesus' life because the work has to be done to its fullest. It's the difference between death on the one hand and the delicacy of being granted to eat of the tree of life by our resurrected Lord Jesus Christ himself. As Jesus faces this increasing persecution and opposition, he maintains this razor-focused, purposeful faithfulness. Again, as Matthew was reflecting on Jesus, as he's gazing on his memory of 
his master, as he's going about this work, even under threat to his life. Matthew then shows us that what Jesus is doing, his demeanor had been prophesied by the prophet Isaiah, and he quotes Isaiah chapter 42. And he quotes this to show us that when Jesus was doing all of this, when he was purposefully faithful in this purposeful ministry, he had a paradoxical demeanor. He reflected on the one hand bold faithfulness, but on the other hand a thoroughly humble meekness. This brings us to our second section, a paradoxical approach. In verse 17, Matthew writes this, Jesus is fleeing and continuing on his work. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Now what Matthew quotes again is from Isaiah chapter 42, but he's not quoting it verbatim, word for word for word. He is giving us an interpretation. He is showing us from the text of Isaiah 42 and drawing out and applying to show us how Isaiah 42 was written to foretell the ministry of our Lord Jesus. And so we read from Isaiah 42, which Matthew quotes here in verse 18, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen. The Lord calls Jesus. We have the voice of the Father speaking of God the Son incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ. Behold my servant. Now, Calvin is correct here that the word servant is not something meant to demean Jesus. This is a title of eminence, a title of, of respect, a title of signifying the importance of Jesus. Um, we don't think of servants as particularly high, but in the ancient world, if you were a servant to a, to a high person, a servant to the king, you were extremely important. Uh, think about in, in our own culture, uh, the chief of staff for the president of the United States, not an elected office, um, constitutionally no power, but the chief of staff of the president of the United States is arguably one of the most important people in the functioning of this country because the chief of staff has the power to determine the strategy and the schedule of the leader of the free world. Now, this person certainly is a servant of the president, serving as at the pleasure of the president. So he's a servant, but yet you can see how that is a very high, important office. The same thing is true here. This servant of the Lord, Jesus certainly did take on the form of a servant, but here we are reading about servant in terms of the importance of this servant. Because we read, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen. Jesus is the chosen servant of the Lord. My beloved Jesus is the beloved servant of the Lord, and with whom my soul is well pleased. This says something about the success. This says something about the fact that Jesus has not taken his eye off the ball. He has not been distracted. He has not been wayward. He is not wasting his time. Jesus is well pleasing in everything the Father sent Jesus to accomplish. And this is important. This characterization of the servant, just these few descriptive words about the servant is very important because it deliberately contrasts with the way that the Pharisees evaluate Jesus. The Pharisees are ready to kill Jesus. But the Lord, speaking through his prophet Isaiah, declares a word of absolute approval of his son. My servant whom I've chosen, my beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased. We might ask, why do the Pharisees get it so wrong? Why are they ready to kill Jesus? The Father is so pleased with Jesus. And the answer here comes in the next line from the prophecy. I will put my spirit on him. Now, when we read that the Lord puts his spirit, and now we're dealing with the third person of the Trinity, to clothe the incarnate second person of the Trinity, we are reading about the power. We are reading about the strength. We are reading about the the success that, that the servant is being ensured by being anointed with the spirit of the Lord we are also understanding that what Jesus has is is invisible because it is spiritual. The Pharisees cannot see it. And more than that, not only can't they see it, they misunderstand what they do see. Yet in spite of the Pharisees' misunderstanding, Jesus presses forward. He's not waiting until everyone understands what he's doing to press forward with his mission. No matter who opposes him, Jesus goes about his work. We read that his work is to proclaim justice, Gentiles. Jesus came to proclaim justice to the Gentiles. Now, this justice is an idea that fills up everything that Jesus came to accomplish in his redemptive work. 
every injustice that has been perpetrated, Jesus came to set it all right one way or another. Either by judging as guilty those who are guilty, or by taking upon himself the punishment of justice that God determined against us as punishment for our sin. Jesus comes to bring complete justice and even to proclaim this beyond the nation of Israel to the nation, to Gentiles. So in the immediate contest, we have to think about the Sabbath. Jesus had again taken the withered up, twisted Sabbath that the Pharisees insisted upon, and he stretched it out. He made it full and whole and healthy and just. Because Jesus showed that God's intentions for the Sabbath were never to be something which is regulated by legalistic rules, but it's supposed to be a time of doing mercy and doing good. Not only for the Jews only, and their narrow legalistic concerns, we are seeing here that the mission of the servant is to proclaim this justice to Gentiles. Now at this point in the prophecy, the Lord makes an important clarification about his servant's demeanor. And this is uh, where we're talking about the paradoxical approach of Jesus. Yes, the servant will proclaim justice boldly, but he will not do so belligerently. Boldly, yes. Belligerently, no. So we read, he will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. This doesn't simply mean that he's not going to be noisy. That he's going to be perhaps timid in some respect. It means simply that he is not going to be argumentative about it. He has come to humbly do his work, to humbly and meekly and quietly do the mission that his father has given him, no matter who does or does not approve of it. At the same time, we read that also, even though he is bold, he will be absolutely gentle with those with whom he interacts. We read in verse 20, one of the most beautiful promises about Jesus, that a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench. One commentator, Leon Morris, explains that in those days, reeds were very uh, cheap and inexpensive. They, glue, they grew along rivers and things like that. So you could find them all over the place. They were very cheap. You could bu build anything from a flute uh, to a pen with them. You could do all kinds of things with these reeds. Uh, but yet, um, because they were so plentiful and cheap, they were very disposable. The same thing was true of, with wicks. Wicks were made of flax. Again, this is not some really expensive thing. These were commonly used. And when a wick got burned up enough, it wasn't worth going to the trouble of trying to repair it. You just got rid of it. Not so Jesus. Try to capture maybe the disposability of what Jesus is getting at. Think about this. Think about if, if in a modern context we sort of gave a modern paraphrase and said, a splintered toothpick he will not break, or a used Kleenex he will not discard. These are one-time use things that we use and, and without a thought throw it away. No one would ever think about repairing a toothpick. No one would ever think about laundering Kleenex so that it would be clean to use again. Yet Jesus doesn't dispose of what seems to be utterly, eminently disposable. Now, of course, Jesus is not talking here. The Lord is not talking about Jesus' interactions with disposable goods. These things are metaphors for bruised, broken people. People that the world sees as castaways, as unimportant. Jesus restores what is broken. He restores what is damaged rather than casting it away. I think this is something we need to give more careful consideration than we might. We live in an economy built around disposability. Again, on the low end, things like toothpicks and Kleenexes, single use, throw it away. But even on the high end, we have planned obsolescence of every gadget we buy. You do not buy a smartphone and thinking, I am going to lovingly present this to my grandchildren someday. Uh, you think, I am going to use this until the iPhone, whatever we're on, comes out, right? We plan for the latest and the greatest to come along and displace what we have and throw it away. We live in a disposable culture. We do not understand cultures where dur durability and repairability were important things. I once knew an older auto mechanic who told me that never in his lifetime had he ever purchased a lawnmower. Every lawnmower he had ever received was one that he found discarded in front of someone's yard. You know, the free sign to take it away? Every one he had just picked up on the side of the road, and he, because he was a mechanic, he was able to repair it. And never in his life did he ever have to pay for a lawnmower. Certainly that took skill, 
And that took time. But he wasn't all about throwing those things away. He lovingly repaired them. But if we're surrounded by a culture of disposability, is it any wonder that we treat human beings as disposable too? Jesus, however, does not break the bruised reed. He does not quench the smoldering wick. He brings so much gospel comfort to every one of us. Jesus should cast us aside by our own logic of how we interact. Jesus, as the Lord's servant, accomplishes the most powerful ministry in the most absolutely gentle of ways. Are you seeing why work takes so long? Are you seeing why this process is so careful? Jesus now raises a question. But this, all of this raises a question, rather, because Jesus does not play the world's game by the world's rules. There is a question still. Okay, this is a really wonderful pie-in-the-sky idealistic thought that you have, but will this actually succeed? And that's what comes to our last section. Number three, a promised victory. A promised victory. At the end of verse 20, we read that Jesus does all of this until, until he brings justice to victory. Notice the time that is in view here. All of this is happening. All of this is taking a long time. All of this has only begun in the fullness of time after hundreds and thousands of years of God's working out his redemptive purposes before Jesus. And even now, what's taking so long does not in any way hinder the ultimate success of this mission until he brings justice to victory. Victory will come, but not immediately. And again, justice here is a justice that has in view the whole scope of Jesus' redemptive work and mission in the world. Much of what this has in view has in view the suffering of Jesus. Greg Blumberg writes about this past passage. What this means is that Jesus' cross must proceed. Well, certainly his cross must proceed resurrection victory that we are giving special attention to today. In, the, in this time, Jesus must fill up his sufferings, including fleeing from those who would kill him before the time to actually kill him comes to pass. But while the ministry of Jesus must fulfill all righteousness, progress is not always apparent. Even so, even so, what the scriptures are assuring us of is that the eventual success is guaranteed. And more than that in verse 21, that this eventual success will be universal. And in his name, verse 21, the Gentiles will hope. You see, so often we read the story of Jesus, and even fast-forwarding, so often we think about our own lives, it seems that there are constant steps backwards in God's progress in the world. One thing happens, and then there's another disaster. Another thing happens, and maybe it seems good, but then all of that comes to nothing. But what we are told in the Scriptures is that whatever it seems to us, Spirit of God is purposefully moving Jesus Christ, our Lord, toward his promised victory. Victory that Jesus Christ will win, that will extend to all the nations of the world. But in the meantime, how long is this going to take? You know, I think that's a question that all of us have asked at one time or another, especially in a restaurant. What is taking so long? How long is this going to take? And some of these are expectations shaped by the kind of restaurants. Maybe you are not like me, a fugu fish kind of a diner. Uh, maybe you are a Wendy's sort of a diner. And uh, this last summer, we went to a Wendy's, and we were there for an hour at a fast food restaurant, an hour. And we kept asking, what is taking so long? Uh, this is not here in, in this town. This is another city. We were traveling. I just want to be not to demean any Wendy's here. And I'm sure they were just having a bad day. But I could look back in the kitchen, the way those are structured, and I could see that everything was a disorganized mess. I could see that people were being sloppy in what they were doing, that the workers were lackadaisical. And I'm thinking, what is taking so long? But how that context would change if I knew they were preparing fugu fish. If they were back there with sharpened, now maybe I go to another restaurant, but if they were using sharpened knives and I knew that my life was at stake, perspective changes here. I'm not banging on the table wanting them to rush that work. I'm saying, get it right. The question is not how long. The question is, make sure this isn't going to kill me. Now in the meantime, scriptures are still teaching as we wait, as we see the fullness 
of everything that Jesus has done and is doing as he continues to bring his enemies under his feet. That's what Jesus is doing right now. It began with the decisive victory on Easter Sunday, on the resurrection day when Jesus Christ arose in victory forever over sin, death, and the devil. But Jesus is still at this work. And the scriptures teach us as we await this work to say, how long, O Lord? The Psalms give us that language. How long, O Lord? But the scriptures, they also pull back the curtain for us to see into the kitchen, to see that the master chef is at work and he's not sloppy, he is not lackadaisical, he is doing everything necessary to prepare for us. In the words of Isaiah 25, verse 6, which we looked at last Easter, feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined, as he prepares to swallow up death ever. Jesus is still bringing it's justice and victory. The well, application point as we think about the success and the victory of Jesus is this. Wait patiently for the final victory of Jesus. The decisive victory was, was won on Easter morning, on Resurrection Sunday when Jesus rose from the dead. If there was ever any doubt, Jesus' victory over the, the, the sworn enemies of humankind, sin, death, and the devil, that was the mortal blow he struck against death. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh grave, is your sting? Jesus won the decisive victory that day, but he has not yet brought everything to pass to bring about the final victory. And we're called to wait patiently for this. In this, Jesus' life and his ministry lays down a pattern of patience for us. We are to see exactly in what Jesus is doing here how we are supposed to live. Jesus was faithful to correct his opponents who had twisted the scriptures. But at the same time, Jesus was humble to avoid the spotlight and human praise. Jesus was content in all of this to fill up his sufferings until his final suffering at the cross. And through it all, Jesus was patient, meek, and gentle. Why? Because Jesus lived his life with eternity in view. But the author of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 12, verse 2, for the joy set before him, our Lord endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. On Easter, we remember that all suffering, even death itself, Jesus has proven to be. Death did hold the power, but Jesus knew that he held the keys to the grave. And Jesus knew that in order to win the final decisive victory over death, he would have to fulfill all righteousness. That through the course of his life, whatever suffering the moment required, he endured it. Jesus was not an overnight success. He also knew in this, as he was methodically, meticulously, patiently fulfilling every bit of the, the righteousness of God, he knew that eventually he would bring that justice to victory. And Jesus teaches us to approach suffering in our own lives with the same kind of patience. He teaches us to persevere as we continue to cry out, How long, O Lord? Now, the Apostle Paul writes much about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. We've preached on uh, 1 Corinthians 15 the last uh, the couple of uh, Easter's before that, and in that chapter, Paul concludes with 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. That's the final word that Paul gives us in light of everything that he writes about the resurrection, which we surely must be raised up with Jesus. If he has been raised, we too will be raised. Our confidence is different even than the Lord's confidence as he's growing through what we're reading about him in Matthew chapter 12. Because we know, even though Jesus knew he would win the decisive victory, he had not yet done it. He still had to pass through it. But we live life knowing that Jesus has already accomplished all of this. So yes, we live surrounded by a culture decaying under its own decadence. We live surrounded by pressures, politics, and outright persecution. We live surrounded by failures and setbacks in the broader church and in our own personal lives. And in all this, we are so tempted to ask, what's the point? How can we carry on? How long must this continue? Because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, we are reminded in confidence that he will come again. And whatever setbacks and failures 
and losses that we endure today, we know that the eternal victory of our Lord does not hang in the balance. He has not, he cannot be dethroned. He is still, he is not struggling to stave off a coup. He still possesses all the power. He cannot lose because he has already defeated sin, death, and the devil forever. And in his name, the gospel goes out to all nations so that in him, we Gentiles may hope. Not only because of his victory, we also have hope because of his gentleness. Jesus is the one who will not break a bruised reed or quench a smoldering wick, even in death. We are reminded in Psalm 116, verse 15, that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Those who hope in him, we will not be trampled when he arrives. We may have confidence that when he comes, he will bring his justice, which brings our salvation all the way to its fullest victory. We then will rejoice with him. He cannot lose his own. A hope we have now and forevermore comes in the perfect, unshakable promise of Jesus, established on the perfection of his birth, his life, his death, and of his resurrection. The promise we have is that Jesus cannot lose a single one who comes to him in faith. As Jesus promises in John 6, verses 39 through 40, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. If you don't yet know Jesus this morning, would you turn to Him today? This day where we give special attention to the resurrection hope that we have as believers. This day where we are reminded that there is victory and forgiveness over sin for all those who repent from their sins and turn to Jesus This day when we are reminded that if he has risen from the dead, so also will we rise with him. If you don't know him, will you turn to him in faith this morning? Or this morning, maybe you've lost confidence. Maybe your confidence has been shaken. It feels wobbly this morning. Do you not see that Jesus is still at work? That he is still bringing his justice to victory? Will you repent? Will you cry out to Jesus, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief? Will you trust in him? Or if you feel that you are drowning in your suffering this morning, maybe you're suffering related to death, will you look to the one who raises the dead, the one who holds the power in his hand, the one who is still working, who has not forgotten what he is doing? He is patiently, meticulously, methodically preparing you a rich feast, well-aged fine and rich wine and rich food for all of eternity to enjoy in his presence without death. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would give us the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would give us salvation in him, that you would give us hope in the Lord, And that through Jesus, you would give us confidence to endure the way that our lives don't go always as we want them. The unexpected twists and turns, the setbacks, the failures, the losses that we face. We pray that we would see all of this in light of your powerful, sovereign hand. As we are confident because of your word that you are still bringing justice to. We know through faith we stand again with you when you return. And quickly, Lord Jesus, we pray.